Welcome to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast, where we have in-depth discussions on cryptocurrency policy and regulation. I'm Paul Brigner, and I'm head of U.S. Policy and Strategic Advocacy for the Electric Coin Company. In a few moments, you'll be joined by Gary Weinstein, head of Global Regulatory Relations for Electric Coin Company, and Amanda Wick, the founder and CEO of the Association for Women in Cryptocurrency. We believe in fostering a respectful and inclusive environment for our discussions. And while Gary and I have strong views on the need for private and confidential financial transactions in cryptocurrency to empower economic freedom, our guests may have differing views and opinions. Through these thought-provoking and at times challenging conversations, we aim to deepen our understanding of complex policy and regulatory issues and work towards the development of pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not legal or financial advice. Guest remarks may not reflect the views of their organizations or those of Electric Coin Company. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the podcast. Well, we're excited to introduce our first guest, Amanda Wick, a leading expert in the field of blockchain and cryptocurrency with extensive experience in government enforcement, policy, and the private sector. Amanda is the founder and CEO of the Association for Women in Cryptocurrency, a nonprofit association that supports the advancement of women in the future of digital finance. She previously, and up until very recently, served as senior investigative counsel for the House of Representatives Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol after serving in various policy and enforcement positions at the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, and the United States Department of Justice. She was Chief of Legal Affairs for Chainalysis, where she advised both internal and external stakeholders on the forefront of cryptocurrency and its constantly evolving landscape, and an advocate and educator for Chainalysis in the larger cryptocurrency market. Prior to Chainalysis, she served as a Senior Policy Advisor at FinCEN, where she specialized in digital currency and human trafficking issues. She also served as a trial attorney for the Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section, MLARS, of the U.S. Department of Justice. As a trial attorney, she prosecuted cases around the country involving sophisticated money laundering asset forfeiture and complex financial investigations with a specialization in cryptocurrency. Prior to MLARS, she served in the criminal divisions of three U.S. attorneys' offices as an assistant U.S. attorney Asset Forfeiture Coordinator, and Financial Crimes Task Force Coordinator. Amanda, <laughs> that is an outstanding and impressive background. It's such a pleasure to have you here today with us. It's very exciting to be here with you on your inaugural uh, launch of the podcast. It's an honor to be your first. Uh, thank you so much. So let's dive into it. How did the idea for the Association for Women in Cryptocurrency come about, and what are its main goals? How do you see the association contributing to the promotion of diversity in the blockchain industry? Yeah. So when I was at the government, uh, I was surrounded by women in crypto. Uh, a lot of us did work in either crypto prosecution or investigations. And I looked around and saw women in crypto everywhere. And then when I left the government and went to Chainalysis and I looked around just the general field of tech and fintech especially, uh, there were women doing the work, but they were not profiled at all. In fact, if you looked at kind of what was publicly out there of the crypto industry, it was extremely male dominated. This crypto bro culture, just just even like the mention of it was what tended to dominate. And there were a lot of women in the space, but you wouldn't have known it from what was publicly being shown. And so I started a speaker series with uh, some amazing supporters at Chainalysis. Um, my team there, uh, Molly Saint and Maddie Kennedy, started with me this series, Women in Crypto. And it was just to highlight that there were women out there in venture capital, in U.S. Gov, in investigations, in finance. Uh, and it was huge. We had women from all over the world coming at all hours of the night to network with other women and meet the other women out there. And I thought there was something here that needed to be grown and watered and encouraged. And while I was on the hill uh, on the side, I was starting this and getting it ready to launch when I finished, uh, when the when the committee finished. So that was the genesis of it. And it's been incredible. Um, the hope is to not just support the women who are members, but also raise the profile of women in the industry so that we have more inclusion in the future of digital finance in a better way than traditional financial services has historically done. 
That's fascinating. Is it based anywhere in particular, or are you going for the digital nomad experience? <laughs> well, I have enjoyed the digital nomad experience. Um, it's a, Technically, I'm based in D.C., but what's been amazing about the association is that we've actually launched globally. So our first launch events were in uh, Northern California, D.C., and New York. And then we also had launch events in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, in Singapore. And then we just recently had a launch event in London. We also did a couple of smaller informal lunches in Switzerland. And our hope is to really be a global association that builds a network and uh, a basically a like a network and a, a Rolodex of women so that there's never a cold call for a woman in the industry to find somebody else. And we made it industry specific and not level specific. So it's not just for senior women, it's for everybody who's in the industry who believes in advancing inclusion and supporting other women. So we have student members who are in university. We have women who are C-suite level executives. And that was purposeful because we believe that women of all levels can learn from other women. And those of us that are more senior want to give back to younger women. And frankly, I, I've learned so much from the younger generation that I can't imagine if it was just all of us old OGs talking to each other, we would miss out on a lot that the younger generations have to contribute. So it's been uh, all ages and all locations. And it's been truly great seeing kind of like the global connections that we're making. Fantastic. And there have been a lot of articles lately about ESG and financial inclusion and diversity inclusion. Um, but it seems as if there are a lot of organizations out there just giving lip service to those very important goals. I'm impressed that the Association for Women in Cryptocurrency has this grand opportunity to actually build out a true ESG profile that might serve as an example for other large corporations. Do you see um, that achievement as one of the goals of the association, or are there other um, uh, more important goals that will have better traction for actual advancement of women in the blockchain industry? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I And I, I want to be fair to some of the associations out there where I I'm sure they don't intend it to be lip service. I think it's just very hard to actually gain traction and improvement. And some of that is just being in the right place at the right time. There are a lot of women who came before me, some of whom are founding members of my association who are kind enough to share like lessons learned. Sometimes you're just in the right place at the right time. And there's a tipping point where it feels that it's always been important. Inclusion's always been important. Diversity has always been a value to any entity that supports it. It just feels that now it's different because it feels like things have gotten so bad so fast that now there's a recognition that's more than lip service, that inclusion is now a necessity. I think the FTX implosion has actually helped that in the sense that crypto for a while was very much the wild, wild west. And there were a lot of women, many of whom I know, who were the ones in the room, often the lone voice saying, hey, we don't want to do it this way. Like we need a little bit more rails. Like this is financial services. You're moving money. You're not creating widgets. And unfortunately, a lot of times they were ignored. And so I think now as you see the crypto and blockchain industries having to grow up and mature, there, there's a little bit of a vindication there for a lot of women who are in the industry who are said we could have done this years ago. Now it's time to listen. I hate to use the term the adults in the room. <laughs> But some people have phrased it that way, where just historically women tend to be a little bit better at identifying risk and suggesting kind of risk management, whereas men tend to be the more kind of less risk adverse, we'll say. And so I think there's a really good time now for the benefits of inclusion being very obvious and saying we need more and different voices in the room to have these conversations. Sounds like what you're saying, too, is that diversity can promote strategic advantages for organizations. Yes. Uh, well, that's been established like time and time again in study after study. I don't know anybody who would be so kind of blithely ignorant to say that there's no value in diversity because it's just been disproven in so many studies. The real problem is that, and I talk to men about this all the time because I had a lot of guys contact me after we started the association saying, I would love to have women in my company. I would love to show where are the women. I'm constantly looking for women. There's no women in crypto and blockchain. I'm like, they are there. Trust me. The The issue is, is that we are so comfortable with unconscious bias and we don't realize that it takes 
intentional inclusion to undo that. So it's an it's an active practice to be diverse. Like you actually have to take action. And too often, what, when you say lip service, I think what it really is, is it's just easier to say something as opposed to do something. And it's not that people don't care about it or think it's important. It's just that it takes an extra step to then do. And when and when men ask me, how can I help? What can I do? I say, be intentionally inclusive. If you are asked, invite four friends to dinner, who are you going to invite? You're going to invite the same four people that you're comfortable with, that you know, that you know, I have a good time with these four people. You probably wouldn't say, let me try four strangers that I don't know and give them the opportunity to meet each other and network because we tend to do what's comfortable. And so the idea with intentional inclusion is I tell men, the next time you have an opportunity, invite a female speaker, invite a junior member on your team to lunch. If you are intentionally inclusive and make an effort to include women and people of color, because that's just as important, my association just happens to focus on women But if you're intentionally inclusive, then we actually have a chance of doing actions that will change things and move the needle. But if we just keep talking about it, no, that does not do anything, unfortunately. So that's really one important point about the role of allies in supporting the Association for Women in Cryptocurrency. Are there any other roles for allies where um, the goals of the association could be amplified? Understanding, of course, that there needs to be um, the power and the structure of uh, the association to do for itself what it is looking to accomplish and not necessarily rely on allies. But I imagine allies could be helpful at times. And I, oh, I'd love to yeah, identify no. other opportunities for those allies to be integrated with your association. Yeah. People ask us all the time, like, do you allow men? I'm like, of course we allow men. It, it would, For me, it would be very hypocritical to say, we want inclusion and then be exclusive and say that we don't want men at our events. We have male allies at most of our events. Now, they're usually small in number. I think the most we've had at any one event was like five. But it's always a really great thing when they come because like our, our London I- event, for example, we had one male ally come and he said to me afterwards, he said, I can't remember the last time I was at a professional event where I was the only man present. It, is this what it's like for you? Because it was a very disorienting feeling. And I said, yes, especially being like former, you know, law enforcement. I was frequently the only woman in the room sometimes in in a team full of agents or in crypto even sometimes, right, in a room full of men on a panel full of male speakers. And it builds empathy. And then male allies are even better allies because for a moment they understand what it's like to just be the odd person out. So Coming and understanding that is a huge thing. And a lot of our events have actually been sponsored. Our London event was sponsored by a law firm, Peters and Peters, and it was spurred by an attorney, Keith Oliver, who's been a huge supporter since I started this. So through supporting this, through being present, through talking about it, I don't think you can, I think it's, I think it's really ignorant to think that we're going to solve this by not having the help of men. If, if men are dominating an industry, and you think that just a bunch of women getting together are going to solve the problem, that's not going to happen. We need male allies. And they're out there. I think the most frequent question I get is, how do I help? And so it's just changing the mindset to be conscious of the bias, seeing it, and then being intentionally inclusive. And male allies, frankly, are just as, if not more important to that equation than the women in the network. That's great. And if one wanted to learn more about the association. Uh, is there a website oh, yeah. to go to? What What would you direct our audience to to learn more about the association? So we do have a website. It's womenincrypto.org. But I would actually direct people to our LinkedIn page. Uh, we have a publicly available LinkedIn page. And if you follow it, we we not only post about our events, but we also post about our members. Because one of the things that the association is doing, at least from my perspective, networking is great. Professional development is great. But one of the things that separates women in the industry from men in the industry is that women don't hype each other as well. They don't hype themselves. They don't hype each other. Like what what men tend to be better at is self-promotion. And sometimes women are less comfortable with that. So we're an association that says, just tell us what you're doing and we'll promote you, right? Let us be kind of like your PR for the world to know, hey, there is somebody out here who's a subject matter expert 
who's doing this that you should know about. And so we're constantly posting about our members' accomplishments, talks they're giving, articles that they've published. Um, and so it's a really good way to stay on top of things is to actually follow our LinkedIn page. Thank you very much. And I'm sure our audience will uh, be very happy to go and learn more about the Association for Women in Cryptocurrency. As you mentioned at the very start, Amanda, you are the first guest of this podcast. I'm really interested to know what message would you like to convey to our audience about the importance of understanding the intersection of cryptocurrency and public policy, given your extensive experience in government enforcement and policy as Senior Investigative Counsel for the United States House of Representatives and your time at FinCEN and the Department of Justice? Yeah, so I think because of my experience in the executive branch and the legislative branch and private sector now, I think it feels like we're at a very critical tipping point between the industry and regulators. And it feels like it's been building up over the last decade where, where you had this convergence of industry for, I think, too long basically saying, don't regulate us and not really putting forward useful suggestions. And I think that's changed recently. And then government also not doing necessarily the best job of reaching out to industry. And you saw advancements in this where industry got more cooperative and started building associations and having trade associations and groups that would go forward and kind of say, hey, we're here, we want to help. And you saw government, you know, starting to build innovation programs and programs that were looking towards the future and saying, we need to be more proactive. I think both sides are still not doing it well enough for where we need to go. I think that there is a deficit on the industry side where there aren't enough people in the government who know how this stuff works. And frankly, there's not enough vision of people in government to see where this needs to go. And they need industry to be more proactive about not just having the conversation of these are our problems, but here are solutions. There are some, there's an association that is working on building a self -regu regulatory a group. That's amazing, right? But the industry saying, like, we need to take responsibility for our own standards, I think is a move that's a fantastic direction, right? Because you have uh, FINRA, you have other groups that are doing that, and there's not that for digital assets. And I think a lot of people think there needs to be one. But conversely, on the government side, you have these. You know, when I was in the government, it felt like you're on an aircraft carrier that's very difficult to turn. There's no, there's not a ton of vision. There's not a ton of let's try to proactively make things better. It's very reactive and it's frankly slow to react, right? And so this is an area where we've had over a decade and we still don't seem to have anyone saying, okay, we need to make changes. We need to do rulemaking. We need to do something beyond just kind of what people called regulation by enforcement, but for some agencies, that's that's you know what they're able to do, and the the leaders at these agencies aren't making it any easier for the people who know what they're doing to come forward and say, hey, this is what we really need to do for the future. So, I think we're at this point where we really need both sides to step up better and work together better for a proactive solution, as opposed to what it feels like, which is sadly, waiting for the next 9-11 that then merits a Patriot Act. And it would just be great if we didn't need a catastrophic event to make a real change for digital assets. That's quite insightful, Amanda. Thank you. I think what it causes me to want to ask you is a bit of a spicy question, if that's okay. Um, in President Biden's March 2022 executive order, he calls for the responsible development of digital assets. That is one perspective. I wonder if we also need to think about the responsible regulation of digital assets, such that consumers can still be protected, where financial stability is maintained, but where regulation isn't so aggressive that it chases blockchain technology to the far corners of the earth, where less than high integrity players will be the ones advancing the space. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I think it requires a little bit of a parsed out answer in the sense that you have to have both, right? In the sense that when the order says we want the responsible development, right, of uh, digital technology or fintech or whatever it is, 
Part of that, I think, is a message that going forward, there needs to be more responsibility in the innovation. I think part of the problem is there wasn't that much responsibility in the initial innovation, which is why you now need regulation for things that were kind of launched without a th- seemingly a thought for what should we do versus what could we do. And I think those are two very different questions. And I think at the beginning of, you know, the invention, the, the, the launch of the, you know, the release of the Bitcoin crypto, uh, the white paper, and then you have all these cryptocurrencies and you have all these, you know, technologies and DeFi. I don't know that a lot of people were asking what should we do as opposed to what could we do. And there was definitely a feeling, especially by those of us in the government, that some of these people thought they were inventing widgets and they were, in fact, inventing things in financial services. And when you are building a house or you're building something or you're building a tool, it's different than when you're creating a mechanism that allows the transfer of millions of dollars seemingly anonymously for pennies on the dollar instantly. And with that should have come far greater responsibility than it did. And the problem is, is now you've released that into the wild and now you have to regulate it because it's out there. When people say, oh, you know, is crypto going to be around? I'm like, of course it is. You, you can't undo it. You can't ban it because at a minimum, the criminal utility is always going to be a floor that's never going away. There will never not be cryptocurrency. So what's out there has to be regulated. Going forward, I think you're seeing now conversations like, oh, maybe we should use oracles. Maybe we should build an AML. Maybe we should do this. And I think those are both equally important conversations because there needs to be a recognition that whatever the future of financial services looks like, and it is almost certainly going to be digital, right? It just it, It's just the nature of where society is headed. We have to take into consideration the fact that things are, there will never be the anonymous free flow of money after 9-11. And the, the libertarian roots of crypto refuse to acknowledge that a little too slowly. I think that was frustrating to the government side where where we looked at an industry that wanted something that was impossible and frankly dangerous. And the lack of attention to that, now we're kind of paying for and we're catching up to. So to answer your original question, I think you have to have both. I do think there needs to be regulation. Now, whether it's clarity and rulemaking with what we already have, whether it's some of the bills that are currently being considered to change things, that's a whole nother you know, discussion that we can have if you want. But it has to be both regulating what's already been released and also proactively saying going forward, you really need to take A, B, and C into consideration. It would be great if you could proactively take into concern these what should you do rather than waiting for something to go wrong and then the government reacting and saying, no, you shouldn't have done that and now we're going to regulate it. And I, and, and I think that's a tension that industry and government have had, especially here where it wasn't widgets. It was it was many of these companies are dabbling in financial services with a with a seemingly devil may care that is frustrating for those of us that then have to prosecute the illicit activity or God forbid terrorist financing on the back end. That's a comprehensive answer to the question, and I think it's um, it's quite intriguing, especially when you think about the global nature of the blockchain. You mentioned regulation. Regulation, and I was a former regulator and antitrust prosecutor. Regulation is tough enough when you're trying to determine um, how the interaction between the federal government and the various state governments works, whether the federal agencies even agree with each other, and then add in the global dynamic, and it's a challenge. I'd love to get your thoughts about when you think about the global nature of regulation, how do we, as a society, come up with something that enables this innovation to um, be realized? We're at the very, very start, and we don't know five years from now what this is going to look like. But there is this need for consumer protection and stability. How do you weave together all the different vectors of the various government stakeholders for a multitude of jurisdictions. Yeah. So we dealt with this quite a bit when I was at DOJ because 
we'd have criminals in other countries, we'd need records from other countries, we needed foreign help, and you had some jurisdictions that had no laws about crypto, no laws about digital assets. They they literally had no framework to, to even interact with. So there's a real problem where a number of countries are even further behind than some of those that are leaning out and are trying to regulate or have statutes that deal with this or laws that deal with this. I think the really big problem is that in the past, yes, we had global payments, but we didn't have anything as fast and as truly globalized as cryptocurrency and digital assets. And what's happening, I think, is that you have a financial services industry that is moving infinitely faster than regulators and society is ready for. And what I mean by that is, historically, you had the FATF, right? The Financial Action Task Force. Let's have a bunch of countries get into a room. Let's talk about standards that we should have. And then let's hope that each of those individual countries does a good job putting into place these suggestions. And good luck, Godspeed. And if you do a bad job, we'll put you on a gray list or a blacklist and we'll try to bring you into compliance. That's a very slow, cumbersome, hopeful process. It does not reflect the speed at which digital assets and cryptocurrency is, for lack of a better word, metastasizing around the world. And so when you have countries that have massive adoption of cryptocurrency with zero regulations in place, with zero framework, with not a single investigator who even knows how to investigate cryptocurrency, which is happening, and then you have cryptocurrency companies that are sometimes located in no jurisdiction, and that's somehow allowed, even though they're they're exchanging billions of dollars and somehow like being located nowhere is an acceptable answer, right? There, There is a real problem in that most people don't understand that cryptocurrency and digital assets, for the most part, are a storm in a teacup. Right now, if you ask the superpowers of the world, what thing are you most concerned about? It's not crypto and it's not digital assets. It's national security. It's tariffs. It's nationalism. It's there's so many cyber threats, <laughs> cyber threats, ransomware. And they're tangentially sometimes related to cryptocurrency. But realistically, cryptocurrency and digital assets is not like a clear and present danger that is affecting major superpowers right now. So the willpower to actually put into place any kind of a regime that would require, you know, a, a, uh, VASPs or exchanges to respond to law enforcement requests, to deal with victim funds, to respond. It's not there. And luckily, some of them are in countries that do have positions in place, but some of them are massive and in armed places that aren't that cooperative. And so there's a very real problem of what do we do about that? And historically, the answer for governments is usually nothing until we have to do something about it. And I think even with even with the fall of FTX, yes, that impacted a number of victims who had impact who had invested in FTX. But overall, in the grand scheme of the world, FTX doesn't really matter to anybody outside of the crypto world. And I think people tend to forget that that a Bernie Madoff, right? Fraud, misuse of customer funds. Nobody ran around saying we really need to get rid of the financial planning industry. Nobody's it, the 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 attack on crypto, and, I, and I'm sorry, I got a little off, tan but to me, it's kind of all interrelated. There's not a, it's just not important enough to governments right now to actually fix the things that need to be fixed in crypto. Yeah, and I think that's a really um, insightful way of putting that. I wonder if we are going to see, and I'd love your thoughts about this, any particular jurisdiction lead the way in terms of how crypto assets are regulated? Will it be the European Union? Will it be the, the United States? Will it be um, some other jurisdiction? Do we think that that will instruct nation states in how to best regulate when they see an actual test case in the wild um, with innovators and new asset providers coming under um, regulation that allows them to build out innovative products, but still satisfy uh, regulatory requirements. 
So it's an interesting question in the sense that you would have thought when the UK came up with Mika, right, which is a really comprehensive framework for uh, cryptocurrency and digital assets or digital assets, I'll say. I think they leaned out and it was very comprehensive and everybody was like, oh, look at Mika. And in the United States, you had the Lummis Chilibrand bill, which is a really comprehensive, let's try to regulate this. But you still, Mika just got postponed. The Gillibrand uh, Lummis bill, depending on who you ask, could take up to five years. It, there's still this kind of lack of momentum and lack of impetus, right? And to your point, if one jurisdiction got out there, I don't know because you really don't see a focus on this until it's a national security issue, right? The best example of this was nobody cared for the most part about CBDCs. Nobody talked about it. It was really not on many people's radar until China said that it was going to do a digital yuan, until Russia said it might do a CBDC. And then all of a sudden you had people in the United States who had taken zero interest in digital assets or cryptocurrency who we could barely get to discuss the need for the U.S. government to increase its capabilities and knowledge of cryptocurrency and digital assets. And as soon as the conversation was, but Russia and China are coming out ahead, now all of a sudden everybody was like, well, we really need to talk about CBDCs. And it goes back to the reactiveness versus proactiveness. We needed to talk about CBDCs before, but we tend to wait until there's a reason, until somebody else is doing it. And then it just becomes a chicken and egg problem or a, a cart and horse problem where if the United States is waiting for other superpowers to do something and nothing gets done and they don't do it. And then we're in this vicious cycle of, well, nobody's doing anything. And there's these very, very real problems that are taking up all of the bandwidth of this country. And so the United States doesn't react and it gets backburnered. And then everybody else looks at the United States and says, well, they're not acting, so it can't be that important. So effectively, to answer your question, I guess someday if Russia or China do something with this, maybe then you would see a reaction by the United States and then other countries looking at the United States. But right now, it just, again, until there's a, until there's a massive amount of movement, I mean, the, the crypto market, I believe, is at like $1 trillion or something in activity. And it still feels like to people that it's like a blip on the radar of digital assets, Right. So I don't know what it will take. I don't know how much financial activity has to move into digital assets for governments to start actually caring. My personal fear, like what I'm terrified, is that it will take a bad use instance. It will take a terrorist incident being financed by DeFi. It will take some mass level event being funded by cryptocurrency. And even then, unclear. But but I don't think that anything happens on a large scale without something truly horrible happening that then triggers a reaction. Since you raised Mika, I'd love to dive into that just for a little bit, if that's okay. Oh, God. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm like the worst person to ask on the details of that. Oh, that's fine. I Well, I, I'll give you the details. I'm just looking for your perspective oh, on perfect. a particular point, if that's okay. <laughs> Done. Yeah. So the um, European Union markets and crypto asset regulation will really be up to the trilogue of the European Commission and then the co-legislative bodies, the European Parliament and the Council of the EU. And as you pointed out um, very correctly, it's been delayed for a little bit. But I think what um, the industry is hearing is that uh, we will have an official journal publication probably in the spring, um, some sort of enactment in 2023, and then actual regulatory compliance required sometime in 2024, depending on whether we're talking about stablecoin or um, the remainder of the regime, which is really the bulk of it. There's a particular provision in Mika um, referred to as Article 68. And in Article 68, it describes that exchanges should not be allowed to list coins when the transaction history is not able to be forensic. Meaning, Privacy coins. That's correct. I'd love to get your perspective about whether that is an overregulation, whether there needs to be some sort of understanding or risk-based model that allows KYC exchanges to continue to list 
coins that might have shielded transactions as a feature of the protocol. And whether simply a one-size-fit-all exchanges may not list unless transaction history can be fully explored, whatever that means and whatever implementing regs come down. Um, what What is your perspective on the balance there? Ha have they achieved the right balance? Is that an overreaction? Um, any grand thoughts on that topic generally? Yeah. So I think my question would be, and this is where I always turn to people who are better tech experts, so I might lean on you for this. But I think my question would be, and, and I'm assuming that this is where they're sitting thinking, if a regulator doesn't know the finer details of what an actual shielded transaction means, like what does it look like? If all they know is, oh, it's an obfuscated, you, you can't see the transactions. So how could somebody do KYC or how could somebody do like AML checks on those transactions? There's a possibility that there's an answer for that, right? And industry might know and be able to say, actually, the fact that those transactions are obfuscated doesn't mean that you can't see them. It just means you might have to take an extra step to get them. That's a perfect opportunity for industry to go in and say, I think this doesn't exact this isn't necessary because you could do A, B, and C to actually get this information. It's just not immediately available and publicly seeable. If those conversations aren't being had, then all regulators know is this is obfuscated and people can't see it. And then we don't know what the transactions are, right? And so I think that my guess is, and because this is certainly my perception, growing up as a prosecutor who the minute Monero came out, we thought all criminals are going to move to this. Why wouldn't criminals move to this? This is the depth of the beautiful visibility of blockchain tracing. And that didn't happen. There just simply wasn't enough liquidity. Like there was a, a move that some criminals like went, illicit activity went to Monero, but you didn't see that for Zcash and Dash. You didn't see the giant move of illicit activity to privacy coins that everybody thought would happen. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. But I think the bigger question is, if you're going to have privacy transactions, what is the industry so concurrent solution? And it has to be concurrent for how are we going to make this available to the entities that need to be able to see it? And I think if those conversations went hand in hand, it would be a lot more productive as opposed to launching, you know, we, we put the privacy coin out there. And then regulators come in and all they hear is obfuscated blockchains, and then they want to obliterate privacy coins. But there's room for discussion there, right? Is there, a, is there a way for the technology to balance the objectives of both sides? And I think that is the concept of responsible innovation. Here's an out-of-the-box idea. You know, I was having dinner with a uh, member of Congress. Uh, it was in the last Congress. And very, very smart and up-to-date on crypto, probably had a lecture or two by a cryptographer uh, to better understand even um, the uh, technology and the coding behind some of the protocols. Um, but one of his big frustrations was that members of Congress are not permitted to own and hold and transact cryptocurrency. Is that your understanding? And if, um, if that is the case, should we be thinking about ways that members of Congress and regulators globally can better understand how to buy, sell, and transact with digital assets. I have to admit that's the first that I've heard of a rule that Congress people couldn't buy, sell, or hold crypto. I'm not saying it's not a rule. I, I'm, I wasn't aware that was a rule. I, if anything, the I feel like what everybody told me when I got to the Hill was, you can do things, you just have to disclose it to ethics. So I I don't know if it's a you can't own it without having to disclose it to ethics because our government tends to operate in a um, you can do X as long as you disclose it, right? And we ignore the fact that most people don't look on the back end, which is a whole nother discussion. I would be personally surprised because I know, I mean, don't quote me, but I believe at least one senator who's been a prevalent you know, advocate for crypto has said that they own crypto. So I would be really quite surprised if that's if that's a rule. I, I don't and and I know the point of the question isn't is it in fact allowable or not. I think it's I think it's an interesting question in the sense that there were 
federal agencies that took the position that their agents should not own crypto. Some agencies allowed it. I think it gets to the motivations of if you have the ability to impact a market, should you be allowed to, to own it, right? But the truth is that there's conflicts of interest everywhere in industry, everywhere. It's it's really difficult. And if somebody's going to do something that is motivated for the wrong reasons, banning it, saying it's not allowed is, is not going to matter. They'll put it in somebody else's name. They'll get around it. Like you can't, you can't regulate. You can try to regulate ethics, but I feel like it's largely unsuccessful. That's why I had lots of work when I was a prosecutor. Um, I think it's a terrible idea to say to a congressperson, an agent, that you can't own something because we let them have dollars, even though they might be on financial services. We let them have things, even though they may weigh in on areas of life where they might have an impact. But realistically, I don't want to say they're a drop in the bucket, but they're they're one thing, right, in the calculus. I actually think like the lack of financial literacy in digital assets and people's lack of exposure to it is a huge problem. And it gets to the problem of inclusion. And Chris Brummer is a really good professor on this who um, I follow religiously. Clev Mesidor speaks a lot on inclusion. But it is a very real thing that we unfortunately have a lot of restriction and we don't talk about why that is. People should be allowed to participate in digital assets. P the, the, even the accredited investor rule in the United States, you really have to dig down into why. Why do we limit people from participating in these things? Why can't we just warn them of the risks? Why do you make access to investment so difficult and so high when you could just warn them and then let them participate? And is there bias and a parents patriae type mentality uh, at the core of those restrictions? Because, again, I go back to if a congressperson has X amount of crypto, and I'm just going to use an example, say that they owned, you know, a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and all and and that's actually a, a public right. Like you could pub, you could theoretically publicly know that. But usually they would have to disclose that with the with the ethics committee. And usually I believe it's like publicly available, just like when they own stocks. So if you have a problem with it, if somebody comes forward and says, well, you're advocating for crypto because you own a million dollars of cryptocurrency. But like we used to say, trial lawyers, it goes to the weight, not the admissibility, right? They can weigh in on crypto. Just take just take it with a grain of salt because you know he has a personal investment. But that doesn't mean he can't own it. It just means you know that he might not be the least biased person. But this is throughout the industry. And, and in financial services, too, you have people who are invested in things who then work in a portion of the industry where you have to ask, like, do they have an incentive to not be honest? There are tons of people in the crypto industry who are invested in all sorts of crypto companies who then are blockchain reporters, blockchain analytics companies. Like they they have these roles where it's like, well, are you invested in a portion of the ecosystem where you have a conflict and you're not 100 percent unbiased towards any other portion? And it's really hard to it's hard to, you know, solve all of that. I think disclosure or what is it disinfectant and light what's that expression sunlight might be the best disinfectant yes. there it is yeah i love that by the way amanda paul and i were so excited to have you as our first guest for your deep uh and impressive background but i would be upset with myself if i didn't ask you a little bit about your experience as senior investigative counsel for the united states house of representatives i want to be respectful of the, that position and what you might or might not be able to um, discuss, but are you able to at least give us an overview of your experience um, in that position and how it has informed you and maybe even um, guides your current role as founder of the Association for Women in Cryptocurrency? Yeah, so I think there were two aspects of that role that were very educational. One was being on the Hill in my personal capacity as a staff member present on the Hill at the time. I was able to see what crypto activities, what crypto education was happening and talking to other offices just solely in my personal capacity, not having anything to do with the job. Just as a staff member on the Hill, I was able to see what resources are out there 
if I was working for a member or a senator and I wanted to learn more about crypto. So let me come back to that in a second because it's an area that's really worth talking about because there's not enough crypto digital asset education on the Hill. The second part was my actual job, which as a senior investigative counsel was to investigate the financial aspects of the event, everything leading up to the event, um, and the larger issues of domestic violent extremism, how that's funded, and then the the financial aspects of, you know, the next, how to, how to prevent the next January 6th. Unfortunately, a lot of the investigation wasn't included in the final report, um, which was a shame because there were really interesting things that we learned uh, during the course of the investigation. Um, but some of it has been publicly reported. There were some really great articles that Hate Watch put out about how um, domestic violent extremists and right uh, right wing movements and uh, you know um, what are they racially motivated extremist groups are moving to crypto. I think there was even public reporting about one of the organizers of January 6, uh, Ali Alexander, had publicly available crypto donation addresses. And this is all out there in public reporting. But what was interesting is that, you know, any time that we can show an example of the value of crypto tracing, where we can say, look, this person put their public Bitcoin address out there. I can take that address and I can tell you exactly how much money he raised and exactly where it came from. I can't do that with bank accounts, right? I have to get a congressional subpoena, which is frankly not anywhere near as easy as getting a subpoena when you were at DOJ. And then I have to go track down all these banks and financial institutions. So um, there was an aspect of the investigation of what crypto was involved in January 6th that was super edifying. I don't know that that portion will ever be released. I, I hope the members will release it, but I think right now a very limited amount has been released. Um, but there's been enough public reporting on it that I do think the conversation of domestic violent extremist funding moving into crypto is something that that needs to be looked at. And more importantly, and I saw this when I was at Chainalysis, and I think all of the blockchain analytics companies do a really good job of saying this as loudly as possible, the government's capacity to investigate is incredibly low given the move to cryptocurrency in several threat bands, right? So whether it's ransomware, whether it's cyber attacks, whether it's domestic violent extremism, whether it's human trafficking and child sex abuse material, all of these things that are either increasing in cryptocurrency uh, are relying on the fact that government has the ability to monitor and investigate that and it doesn't. There are some agencies that have that capacity and it's the larger federal agencies, but even then you have small pockets of experts. But state and local governments, if you were scammed tomorrow, there's probably three or four really big, well-known, and I don't mean really big size, I mean like um, capability-wise. There are so few state and local government agencies that know how to investigate this, that if you're a scam victim, you're going into a, a, a bucket that's full, right? And getting the attention for that is very difficult. So we have a real problem where there's a lot of crypto crime. In fact, I think a recent report, I think Chainalysis's crime report just said it the amount of illicit activity had doubled. It's still a relatively low share of all activity, but I think the numerator crypto crime had doubled since last year. And government's, I don't want to say failure, but the government's slowness to address that with resourcing and with capabilities is a huge problem. And whatever the next event is, whether it's another January 6th, whether it's a terrorist event, whether it's cartels, moving into darknet markets, whatever the threat is, we are not ready for it. And we need more discussion around that. And that was something. Um, and now I go back to the, the first point, which was it's very difficult to get funding to agencies that they appropriately need when the people who are doing the funding don't necessarily know what you're talking about. And regardless of how it should be regulated or what should happen in innovation, that is a critical discussion. But the conversation of we have crypto crime now, we have thousands of money services businesses in the United States 
that need to be examined and monitored by FinCEN, which means we need more than 10 people in the division that is responsible for that. And they need hiring authority and they need money and they need the ability to do this yesterday. And that, I think, was one of the things that while I was on the Hill, it's very difficult to get that to House members and senators because everybody wants to talk about all of the great stuff about innovation, but but nobody wants to talk about we really need you to deal with the lack of cryptocurrency and digital asset education now and resources at agencies that need to deal with illicit activity in crypto now. And that's a very real and present threat, I think. I think your point about knowing information to know what to solve for is rather critical. And I would echo um, your thought about the members releasing enough of the information that hasn't been released yet in the report um, in order to be able to um, approach this in a in a way that is impactful and effective. I wonder out loud if, um, since we'll likely never have monetary resources sufficient to do what government wants and needs to do, um, is the approach uh, sort of a mix of leveraging uh, forensics companies such as Chainalysis that you um, led in terms of uh, the legal function, um, plus maybe a little bit of artificial intelligence, um, plus some other um, perhaps decentralized solution, um, maybe even leveraging zero-knowledge technology in order to figure out the balanced and best approach here? I think so. A couple of years ago, um, New York DFS, Department of Financial Services, had a tech sprint. And a lot of us volunteered, got involved, participated on teams. And we had people from all over the ecosystem looking at solving some of these problems. And what was really interesting was that there were technological solutions. In fact, my team used zero knowledge proofs to make the point that we need to be doing all of this differently. We need a data lake where exchanges or licensees can put in their information where law enforcement can search it without necessarily having personal identifying information using zero knowledge proof technology and AI to cross. We, we literally came up with that. The problem is then all of us went back to our jobs and nobody invented it because what's the profit margin for creating something that simply exists to make things better but not necessarily make a lot of money? I think one of the things that's very difficult in the U.S. is that, um, and maybe it's maybe it's a problem for a nonprofit association that looks into this, but it's very difficult to get solutions built that don't make a lot of money because who funds it? Not venture capitalists, because venture capitalists need to see a lot of return. Right now, if you look at the blockchain analytics companies, the tools, especially the leading ones, the tools are very expensive, largely federal agencies can purchase it. A lot of state and locals can't afford even like the top three. So they turn to lesser tools, which means that the data isn't as good, which means that the attributions are worse, which means that it takes longer and their odds of actually finding the solution for victims is going to get worse. And that's not even touching on global capacity, which is nil because most foreign countries, when you get outside of like the UK or the Netherlands or countries that have invested in this technology, but when you get to other countries that we deal with where criminals are, sometimes they have zero capacity whatsoever. They don't have a single investigator, or maybe they have two investigators who are borrowing licenses off of some other country or a country that pays for licenses for another country, but they're not going to be able to pay for it themselves. So you have this massive funding deficit. And I and there are there are discussions, there are agencies that are trying to work on this, but the problem is, you know, how do you get training? that's very complex, right? It, it's difficult. Like crypto tracing is is difficult. Um, I used to joke with my agents because everybody wanted to kick in a door, but nobody wanted to sit and do financial analysis, right? It's the least glamorous, least fun part of the job. And I think we have a real problem in that. To answer your question, people are not building things that don't make a lot of money but they're necessary and they're needed. And I don't know what the solution is because there are smart people out there who have 
really brilliant ideas for how to fix the world. It just takes money and it takes somebody investing in it. And it's difficult in a capitalistic society to do that if it's not a money-making uh, enterprise. It's a save-the-world enterprise. And, you know, to have a full and fair conversation about this topic, I think we need to introduce what um, I'm sure viewers of this podcast will be asking, maybe even yelling uh, out loud, and that is, how do we do all of this but prevent a surveillance society? How do we protect the privacy and security of individuals in a modern society where we are free to have transactions that are not viewable or visible or automatically um, aggregated to create a profile of the user in order to socially engineer or to create honeypots of information that sit on servers that will be hacked and then provided to pariah nation states um, through their efforts. How do we balance all of that? What, um, what considerations do people sitting in government think about when they're looking to protect consumers, they're looking to minimize illicit activity, but they also want to live in a society that is not China, um, that doesn't create these future jeopardy opportunities for honeypot hacking? I think it's an interesting question because as soon as you asked it, I thought about the companies that have all of my data, social media, all of the companies that I go online that I don't manually change all my cookie preferences, because who thinks about that? Who, do, who takes the time to do all of that, right? I don't believe the default in our society is worrying about privacy. In fact, I think most people don't give it nearly as much thought as they should. They just give their data away to everybody. And then... When social media companies or data analytic companies scoop it all up and use it, they don't worry about the ramifications of that. They don't sit and think about their children sitting on TikTok being impacted by Chinese misinformation. They don't think about Cambridge Analytica. They don't think about all of the horrible things that social media and data aggregators are doing in terms of social manipulation, sometimes in the name of marketing or sometimes in the name of um, capitalism or some whatever it is, profit, improvement. But I think that ship has sailed so hard that a lot of times when people are talking about financial transactions and the privacy associated there, I want to say, well, there's a valid concern there. The time to have it was years ago when your data was being gathered and sold. And now to try to claw back privacy over your financial transactions is very hard because the system expects a certain amount of disclosure, right, for the purposes of BSA, AML, whatever whatever the, the compliance floor is for this is the data that we need. And people collect way more than that, right? I mean, the amount of even financial data that some of these companies have, that banks have, right, that, uh, yes, VASPs have, but I think when people are talking about, well, I want privacy over my transaction activity and I don't want anybody to be able to see what I'm doing. It's just not realistic in the sense that your banks have been doing that for years. Your banks have been aggregating and in some ways selling your data to marketing and maybe disassociating it from your identity. So I think a better thing to say or to focus on is the risk of associating financial transaction information being out there with identification information, which is in, in crypto a real risk because unlike everywhere else where your bank information can be sold without your identity attached and that's preserving kind of now it's uh, anonymized, but in crypto the default was so much transaction activity, right? All of your transaction activity put out there without a tie to what it was, just addresses to addresses. And then not tied to identification information, right? That was like the, the privacy aspect. And then blockchain analytics companies come along and they say, hey, we can de-anonymize all this. And now look at the massive visibility that we have into financial transactions tied to identity information. 
I think it's harder to do that than people realize in the sense that, first of all, I don't know a blockchain analytics company that's de-anonymized more than like 40 or 50 percent of the blockchain. So the idea that every single blockchain and every transaction has been de-anonymized is, is not true. And they focus on services and like large scale transactors. So frankly, like a you or a me and our addresses, there's just no functional way for them to care or look at that unless you come on the radar for some reason and there's a reason to know your address and then they might know an individual address. But I say all that to say that like I, I sometimes have the concern that the privacy argument for a person like an individual, I get it, but I just I just don't see the the risk in the sense that I don't think we're close enough with with blockchain analytics to get to that level. I don't know that we could get to that level. And even if we did, for you to be concerned about this versus uh, not you personally, but like for a person to be concerned about the privacy in their blockchain data versus all of the other areas in which the data in their life is being sold, exchanged, I, it feels like it's like worrying about a hole in your umbrella in a typhoon. Do you know what I mean? I hear what you're saying. I wonder if the challenge is we're trying to analyze privacy and security and the need to minimize illicit activity with the snapshot of today's technology, with today's servers that contain today's information. And it gets much more complicated when you think five, 10 years into the future. And are we at an inflection point now where we need to be a bit more creative in thinking about how our private data could be misused in the future? We might not be able to identify um, the entire spectrum of how it could be misused now, but certainly with the rapid advance in technology, including artificial intelligence, I think um, we might need to explore additional ways to decentralize, to add zero knowledge technology, uh, to make sure that there are opportunities for anonymous and confidential transactions because we might end up regretting it five or 10 years from now. Oh, 100%, and just like the like button on Facebook, right? I mean, I analogize it to the lack of discussion of what should we do versus what we could do in social media. In fact, I, I think of that, what was that movie? Um, uh, the one that talked about the social dilemma. I think oh, it was yes. called The Social Dilemma. And it was a number of people, in fact, one specific guy who had started, I think, like the Ethics Foundation for Social Media or something. But it was a number of people who were formerly in social media or were basically a bunch of people in social media who were like, my God, what have we done? Right. And woke up one day and were like, we didn't think about this at all when we were creating the like button. We, we didn't think about the ramifications of algorithms that would actively manipulate people. We it never occurred to us that we could be responsible for dividing society and causing misinformation and allowing Russian bots to just pour in and create accounts and lead Facebook. It didn't occur to us. And I think if what I'm hearing you say is like, should we be having the conversation now to prevent financial services from going the way of social media, where now we're trying to figure, now we have all these societal problems that social media has created, that stuffing Pandora back in the box is impossible. And is there a place to have a conversation about, hey, before the the like button equivalent in financial services creates really bad problems, should we have discussions about what this should be? Absolutely. A hundred percent, we should be having those conversations. I think part of the problem is trying to get people in the government and regulators and frankly, the populace to understand why that's important. A ask yourself the number of people that you know who have had their personal information stolen, their accounts hacked, their identity stolen, their tax returns filed by somebody else who still use the same password for every account. So how do we get people to care about this and take the action to make things different? And this happens to regulators too. I've spoken with a number of state attorneys general who have been hacked mm -hmm. and then had to spend the next year mm -hmm. reestablishing their identity. And, and I would be curious how many of them after that 
started using complex passwords or chain because we're so lazy. I get it so easy to just go back. I had my information, I think during the Chinese hack when I was at DOJ, we got an alert from OPM that was like, do you remember the China hack of like tons of government workers and all of us got like free monitoring or something for two years? I will not even tell you how few of my passwords I changed. It was embarrassing. It was terrible because we've become inoculated to the idea that, well, of course, all my data is out there. I assume my phone number, my social security are out on dark nets. In fact, I can go to what is it? Pwn.com, I think. And I know everybody has everything because we literally are just, I think we're just in, inundated with the horrors of our data being out there. And so I think it's very difficult. I think the challenge is, yes, we need to have those conversations, but how do we motivate those people to have, to motivate people to have them now, to do something different now? And if these little small incursions, right, if a, if a personal hack of a state attorney general doesn't get them, and, and I don't know if that state attorney general took some huge action in their state in response, but, but it's just not what it's just not what you tend to see, right? It's like everybody knows that these are problems. You just don't see the willpower to actually fix it. I think we do need to have those conversations. And I honestly think that it takes more people. It, I think we just need a few more chicken littles. And I think we need some people to say, hey, before the sky falls, why don't we talk about this? Like instead of cleaning this up on the back end, instead of making a social dilemma movie years down the road, what if we had the conversation right now? What should we do about the like button? I do think we should have those conversations. I just, we more people need to be pushing for them. And it is unfortunately a push to have those conversations. And since you are a world traveler and a bit of a digital nomad, um, I wonder if uh, looking to some jurisdictions where the sky has already fallen, such as in China, where, where we are seeing um, dramatic surveillance state activity and its ability to restrict um, not only the movement of its people, but to actually govern their future actions and to punish at will without any due process. Um, there might be examples out there already where we don't have to um, uh, suffer a few more chicken littles here in the United States and learn from examples globally. Is there anything on that? I think the tricky thing there, though, is like I get people, I see people all the time who say crypto is a Ponzi scheme. There's no use case for this, right? And I really can't stand when people make those statements because it's completely lacking in nuance and it's false. Are there problems with crypto? Absolutely. Show me one thing that's perfect. But there's a very, very viable use case that we see over and over in authoritarian countries, right? Like Venezuela. Um, and we saw it in uh, Afghanistan, where after the Taliban took over, you saw people in line for miles outside of financial institutions trying to get their money out of government-run banks. Those people were going to have a very difficult time get, regaining control over their funds. But meanwhile, we had incidents where I, I know of women, but I'm sure there were people other than women who had their cryptocurrency on paper wallets leaving the country with their life savings in their pocket. And the Taliban, thank God, didn't know what a QR code was. And so, right, they're able to actually have control over their finances. When you tell people in the United States the use case of remittances or of personal autonomy over their funds in the event that a government decides to unilaterally take their money, it's such a foreign concept to them that they don't think it's a valid use case because nobody in the United States could even imagine things going. To, and I'm not talking about China. I'm talking about before China. So when you use the use case of China on people who have never lived in a like they can't wrap their head around the authoritarianism because to them it's really, really far off. But they're not looking at the incremental changes that might suddenly be slightly more authoritarian or might. When the Patriot Act happened, right, it was so needed for fighting terrorist financing. So the frog in the water. Right. This is essentially the thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are parts of the Patriot Act that I couldn't have done my job without. But I think a lot of civil rights activists would tell you there were parts of the Patriot Act that were horrible. And after that, you had the, uh, you know, the the listening, you know, the the you had a lot of incursions 
on on private liberties, right? And at the time, it was, well, this is justifiable because of who we're going after and who we're looking for. And a lot of people didn't care. And so, yes, the frog in the pot is 100% the problem. It is, And it's the scarier thing because a horrifying catastrophic event would jar people, right? If all of a sudden tomorrow we went to China, all of a sudden you'd be able to persuade them this is a very real threat. But what do you do if it's not an overnight turn into an authoritarian government? What if it's a day by day, incremental by incremental turning up of the heat? And then you're at frogs in a pot. And so I think it is frustrating for people who see these incremental movements or these very concerning like, hey, yes, the visibility of the blockchain is fantastic as long as you have full faith in who has that visibility. And if you don't, then what's the solution, right? And I do think you have a frog in a pot problem where it's very difficult to tell folks right now that that is a possible problem in the future because it's not a massive incursion on their liberty that causes them to worry. It's small incremental steps. And it's also possible steps that if they haven't seen it in their lives, just doesn't seem very real to them because most Americans, if it's not happening, and actually this is just people, not Americans, but for most people, if you haven't personally experienced it, it's very difficult to imagine and wrap your head around it. And for us, that kind of concept of authoritarian access to your data, you know, they don't they don't think about it. So I think you've helped uh, the two of us identify ten more topics for the PGP <laughs> for Crypto podcast well, that we could dive ten levels deep into. But uh, perhaps we can just lighten the. I know I get, I get so dark so quickly, and well, I apologize for that. But what's so the last year of my life did not help. <laughs> what's so fascinating is everything we've talked about really um, comes back to your experience. You've actually been on the front lines of these very issues in different capacities, um, and it's just remarkable that um, one individual has touched uh, so many different areas of this new technology in so many different ways with different responsibilities. I think, you know, it's funny you say that because I've had a couple of people, because there are times where I've been very critical of blockchain analytics companies, either what they put out or I, I, I'm frustrated sometimes because, you know, they tend to, you know, their, their trainings tend to be towards their tool as opposed to being tool agnostic. And I understand that because they're trying to make money, but it makes it difficult for capacity building. And there are times where I'm critical against the government, even though I used to be in the government. And there's times where I'm critical of industry and they're like, but you're in industry now. And everybody kind of wants you to be a certain thing. And and the benefit of all of those experiences, I try to be very objective and neutral and nuanced because I think what we need desperately right now in the world, but especially in crypto and digital assets, is nuance and objectivity and discussions between people about facts and the ability to have a discourse that is not emotional based, that isn't based on misinformation, that isn't based on all of the crap out there and all of the people who would love for us to just say this soundbite or this soundbite. I may not agree with you necessarily on privacy coins. In fact, my past as a prosecutor, we may not see eye to eye on some things, but I know that we could sit down and have this podcast and have a discussion and get to a place where if my concerns are AML or anti-money laundering and countering terrorist financing and your concerns are privacy and we both respect each other and come from a place of fact and nuance, we could compromise and get to a position where it's the best that I could do and it's the best that you could do. And we are missing that everywhere, especially in this country. And it is going to be the death of us if we don't fix that and have people come forward and say, we need to get in a room and get this right we have to because the alternative is too scary to keep going on these lines of partisanship and divisiveness and misinformation and the complete and utter lack of nuance and discussion. So podcasts like this where you bring people in and you may agree, you may not agree, but you're coming at a place from respect and discussion and factual discourse and objectivity are great. And I think because I worked everywhere, I see the pluses and minuses of all of them because none of them were perfect. They were all a little broken and the system is broken and we have to fix it. And we can only fix it if we can have really honest, objective conversations about 
what compromises we all have to make to fix it. And I hope our viewers would agree that this is exactly why you needed to be the first guest for the PGP for Crypto Aww. podcast. Well, I look forward to the future episodes. I hope it was a good start. I'm sure you'll have much wiser, insightful, smarter, techie people than me, but it was an honor to be selected first, and I hope the bar can only go up from here. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. On behalf of Paul, myself, and all the viewers out there, thank you so much. Thank we really appreciate me. it. I appreciate you guys. Thanks so much.